all last week. I couldn't couldn't make it. Sorry about that. No worries. This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, September 21st, 2023. Uh, I just changed some settings, as you will have noticed coming into the room. I'm going to get a smart transcript after the call, which is kind of fun. Uh, I looked at one. I did a couple of them yesterday because I just turned the setting on recently, and it's really good. It's basically it's turning on the transcript feature somehow, although I don't know that it does so permanently, so I just did so manually. But then it summarizes the call and batches up different parts. It, it notices when the topic changes. It gives a, a nice text summary of what's going on. If you want to turn this on, go into your zoom.us on the browser, go into settings, go into recording or meetings, I've forgotten which one, and turn on uh, AI summaries, or it has a name sort of like that. Oh. Pretty cool. Wish I'd known. Could have used, no, used that yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> we had a great call yesterday. It would be lovely to see a summary of it. Ah. Yeah. Awesome. I wonder whether you can submit the recording to it retroactively. Retroactively. That'd be kind of cool. Let me go find out. That'd be kind of cool. Awesome. Gil, How do you have a, do you, uh, Gil, do you have a recording of yesterday's meeting? Um, I do. It'll be posted um, within within a week, hopefully in the oh, next sure. minute, but within a week. Always, uh, They're always archived on my uh, YouTube channel. I couldn't see myself joining you at 4 o'clock in the morning. I understand. <laughs> Although I did a keynote in Mumbai last year at 4 o'clock in the morning. It was very <laughs> weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the odd hours talks are funny. Yeah, it's hard to get yourself psyched up when you're talking to nobody and it's a really odd hour. Yeah, it just uh, barely works. Acting, uh, acting. That's it. It's acting. Yeah. Um. So I was tempted to go back into the collapse and renewal topic again and to pick some part of it to slow down into, but I'm open to other suggestions if other people would like to go a different way or are tired of the topic. I don't know that tired of the topic is maybe the right language for it since it's all about whether or not we're all going to suffer these calamities. I, I Earlier today, I was listening briefly to Al Gore on stage at the United Nations talking mm. about what's up uh, and what's going on. I loved Al Gore's uh, recent talk, basically eviscerating the COP process and how it's mm -hmm. been captured by fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, made a tremendous amount of sense, and I love seeing Al Gore angry. Um, I think he's very effective angry, uh, but I have no idea. That's just my clue. Um, I think the left doesn't get angry enough oftentimes. Ken, were you going to say something? I, I I watched him. I don't know if it was the same video, but I saw him um, recently where he was pretty angry, like especially about that freaking pop is run by a petroleum company, you know? And That's the I one. Found, I found him ineffective. I, I thought... Ineffective? Tone it, tone it back, Al. Just, you know, you're a little bit too outraged. It's like, we've been outraged for a very long time. More outrage isn't going to help. We need to be very reasonable here and just name things. And like, you know, I, I found him, I, I thought it took away from the power of his message. So I can... thought he was uh, liberated. That's what it seemed like to me. And it was good to see after so many years of Al kind of crunched. Uh how do others feel about who who watched that Al Gore talk, which I will now post into the chat because I found it. Uh, this is the talk we're talking about. Who has watched it? Um, cool. Uh, Doug B, uh, any opinion? Did it Was it positive or negative for you? I'm sort of with Ken. Um, I, the more soporific Al Gore um was sort of a little low on energy i found that a little bit hot and 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 sort of energetically it just sort of projected in a way that could trigger it feeling off and if he pulled it back like 15 percent um that uh the added energy heightens the power of his message but uh it's sort of like he went a little past the the 10 
on the amplifier. So he jumped. <laughs> like he, he, he went to like sharp? eleven or twelve. Yeah, I think some clipping going on. <laughs> I saw I it, too. it, but isn't there a time? Isn't there a time for hot? Yeah, but I saw it too. I wish Al could modulate his tone and his volume. He he, he was uniform. And mm. good speakers, by the, by now he should have been able to go down and up. He was all up, all out, mm -hmm. same yeah. energy. And same mm -hmm. energy gets monotonous. He, he should really be a better speaker by now. Um, Mike, you said that that's the one you watched. Mike, any, any feelings, positive or negative, on, on Al's tone? And you may have stepped away. Um, so I, I'm curious about this question because um, let me let me just sort of dawdle here to explore because I think it matters in the larger question that, about collapse and revival. Um, I, I have a thought in my brain titled uh, this. This may amuse people. Uh, I have a thought in my brain titled uh, "Democrats are finally getting pissed at Republican bullshit, though not enough." And under it, um, I collect up. Uh, and I will share screen even though I think it blows some people's chat away, but just for a moment, uh, under it, I collect instances of uh, Democratic representatives and others. Here, Michigan lawmaker says, we will not let hate win. Jim Jordan gets roasted. Uh, Newsom. Um, I usually have these things connected to the people. Jamie Raskin, who's been doing a whole bunch of this. Uh, here is Joanna McClinton. Uh, and and one of the things I'm believing is that, and this goes back to Lindsey Graham uh, during the Kavanaugh trial. At one point, Lindsey Graham is practically crying and screaming and angry, and he has an impassioned, impassioned talk about how this is a, a terrible thing being done to Kavanaugh. And I realized that, and, and in fact, Kavanaugh himself, when he that morning when he testifies and starts practically crying and says, I like beer, I like beer a lot. And that reminds me of Matt Damon's excellent impersonation of him on Saturday Night Live that night, mm -hmm. that, that, that Saturday, which was really one of the best bits of Saturday Night Live ever. But a lot of people, in, there's just so many angles to this. A lot of people interpreted Kavanaugh's anger as, as outrage at being uh, maligned. Uh, justified outrage and anger. And I, and I was like, the moment he started in that way, I was like, oh, wow, Kavanaugh has decided he's never going to be on the Supreme Court. And he's just going to be really angry here. Or somebody told him to turn up the juice. My, my conclusion was, wow, any anybody who shows up like this and says these kinds of things that are so transparently bullshit, um, uh, it has given up on being on the Supreme Court. And I was, I was way, way completely wrong. Um, and then I, I watched as Lindsey Graham and others have done performative theatrical outrage. And, and there's this whole, you know, outrage industry. Uh, AM radio has largely become sort of, uh, what's it called? Info, anger, it's called angertainment. That's it. Angertainment is the term I heard uh, recently that makes complete sense. Um, and thanks, Pete, for posting the, the cold open for Kavanaugh. It was priceless. It was really like one of the best bits out there. And, and, and I'm completely torn because on the one hand, I want to be Zen Buddhist like Ken and Doug uh, B here. <laughs> and, and really, on the one hand, there's a part of me that's pacifist and Quaker. Now TV, a new way to watch the entertainment you love. Stuart, I think that's on yours that uh, I've just muted you. Uh, sorry. Um, so so there's, there's a half of me that wants to be Buddhist and calm the hell down and take things down a notch and make sure that we can just be present and all those kinds of things. And there's a part of me that says that one of the big problems here is that progressives, liberals, the left, Democrats, whatever thing you want to say, aren't angry enough. And aren't angry enough, which means they sound boring, they're not being heard. Gosh, what they care about must not be important enough. I don't know. And I realize that the kinds of people who might react in the ways I just said are probably not high on the on the spiral dynamic spiral thing. They're probably operating in beige and red, not in teal. And like, well, okay. And and working with Klaus on the the, the short book we're trying to write on Mondays, the Neo book, uh, he's applying spiral dynamics to how do you talk to different audiences about uh, healthy soil and all those kinds of things about regenerative. 
uh, ag. And it's it's kind of interesting because you you know, and he's using ChatGPT as his as his sort of uh, writing partner, and it's turning out pretty good. It, it, it ain't bad. It's pretty interesting. So anyway, I, I'm just putting a stake in the ground that every now and then anger is good. I agree with Kevin entirely that that Al has not figured out how to modulate his presence or his voice, and that's probably a problem. Uh, it would be nice if he took some acting lessons, maybe. Oh, gosh, that sounds terrible. Uh, but uh, Doug, uh, Doug B, off to you. I, um, I really miss profanity in the hands of Democrats. You know, profanity, what makes profanity profanity is linguistically, profanity actually is processed differently by the brain. And it goes right to the lizard brain. It cuts right to the limbic system um, and bypasses all the higher level gray matter stuff. And the, the, the missing moment for me in for our times is somebody just calling bullshit just going what the fuck are you talking about in the congress which for our time would be the equivalent of the guy who in response to joe mccarthy said have you no shame right uh, joseph walsh yeah like that was the end that was the calling the question and I just don't feel like anybody's calling the question. And Al Gore's going to 11, 12 on the volume thing didn't achieve that. It was just increased volume. But it's the somebody actually calling the moment for what it is. And, and the response of all of, you know, it was sort of, you know, Garland getting roasted and then a Democrat would go, I'm sorry. And Garland gets roasted and <laughs> goes, I'm sorry. And Garland gets, but there wasn't a, what are you doing? And even at the expense of order, like interrupting without having the floor and just really disrupting the flow of that from a place of no, just no. And and that just for some reason is like pathologically missing in our culture somehow. I'm not quite sure why. So to follow up of Doug, I think we're not paying enough attention to the tone because the tone of what's being said to one person, it might feel really empowering and to another person, it feels attacking. And that doesn't matter what the topic is or what's being said. And I would like to see a unity around getting away from angertainment because I know, I mean, I get pulled right into it. If it's something that I'm in agreement with, I'm definitely funnier when I'm angry. I can, my, uh, my flow is better when I'm angry, but I also recognize that I'm not in as much control when I'm angry. And I think that goes for all of us humans most of us humans. And again, I think rather than focusing on the words that are being said, the tone is really important. And I'm curious, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about what Klaus is doing because um, Jim White Scarber, I don't know if any of you know him and I'll see if I can get the article. He, he wrote an article, I forgot exactly what it's called, but it for me, it was like a blueprint for how society could be set up. And he used chat GPT to help him. And I read it and it would be great if it were broken up into smaller pieces where regular people would actually read it. But it was so easy to understand. There was really no room to disagree no matter what you believe. And I think that that, that I'm gonna put it in the chat because I think that's a great starting point. So I just wanted to say, focusing on tone maybe could unite some of us. And you could use profanity. It's just the tone in which you use profanity. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, Kevin, then Stuart. I think one of the best iconic and historic uh, ways to express anger is to act through the Babylonian myth of redemptive violence. 
And that's where Marduk in an annual ceremony was the god was humiliated, beat down, his family taken away from him. It's, it's a whole lot like so many cowboy movies, William Money and the Unforgiven. And then he realized that violence was the only way back to restore order. Um, and it's a it, it's in almost every action movie where, you know, if, if Al had talked about the harm of climate change and his realization and then coming up, you know, it would have resonated just like a good action movie does where, you know, the family's taken away and he has to respond. Uh, so I think, you know, it's 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 a really it's culturally in our cultural DNA much more than any Christian myth is actually is the Babylonian myth of redemptive violence. It has a Wikipedia page even. I just put it in the chat. No, gosh. And so it must be real. So it must you know? be real. I mean, it's got to be truth. On the internet. Exactly. Uh, Stuart. Ah, uh, you're muted. I can't remember the what it's called, and I try to look it up, and I couldn't find it. What's the uh, the process they use in Parliament where tongue in cheek they attack each other? Prime you Minister's know? questions. Yeah, yeah. The question, question, question time, question, question, question time. It's tongue in cheek, but it's still you know they like to call each other assholes or whatever, whatever you know other words come up that they actually um, use when they do that. Um, and, you know, there's a there's an outlet uh, of, of some kind. The other thought is, you know, pushing back a little bit upon, uh, you know, what Kevin talked about in terms of violence. Um, years ago, I was interviewed by, by um, a writer for Screenwriters Magazine. And the question was, you know, can you have resolution without violence? Because the typical um, uh, 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 model for any screenwriting is you've got um, conflict, you've got high drama, you've got violence, then you have resolution. And the question was, can you have resolution of some kind without the violence? Um, and, you know, I like to think that you can. Um, you can have lots of drama but you don't have to have the violence. You can have heated conversation uh, almost as a substitute for, you know, for, for violence. Um, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so what's our, what, Stacey, go ahead. I just, I just want to respond to Stuart because I just want to say that I'd like to think that, but I think that for drama, there has to be more of a conflict. And I think that so many of us are actually addicted to drama because it takes us away from what may really be bothering us. And so I think some of us actually create that conflict and that drama. Well, so just, it, there's a, there's, yeah, conflict and drama, absolutely. But you don't have to have violence to get resolution. If we want to think of ourselves as having some degree of civility, you can have dialogue and conversation and then you don't have to have the violence yeah I can think... you have dialogue and conversation with assholes yes <laughs> yeah you can. Violence. you can yeah um there's a, a book i'm reading now monica guzman i never thought of it like that she's one of the founders of braver angels and it's a really excellent book she talks about you know, being a liberal from Seattle and going, taking this bus trip, um, they were going to do this thing called Melting Mountains. They went to Sherman, um, Sherman County, uh, Oregon, where, you know, it was the exact opposite. 74% of the people went for Trump versus 74% of people in, in Seattle who went for um, uh, Hillary. And they had very productive conversations by staying curious about each other and just getting to know each other. Um, I have a friend who says conflict is inevitable, but combat is not. Um, you know, you can use conflict as a productive generative force, or you can use it as a very destructive force. And many, many years ago, I used to belong to a gym um, that that had a bank of TVs over the, the treadmills, and they were all on silent. You had to bring a, a Walkman, remember Walkman, you know, with an FM tuner, and you could listen to it. But I didn't have that. So I would just, I would watch uh, the news and stuff, which was silent. And I got used to just watching people's gestures. And man, you could tell a lot 
in fact, I think it's very instructive to to watch things without sound sometimes, just to see what's going on on the very visceral level of the way people are gesturing and and their their um, facial expressions. And having just completed last night, finally the the full uh, twelve episodes of Oliver Stone's um, uh, Untold History of the United States, when he's showing pictures of Hitler, Hitler was so outrage and he just channeled this thing and the people were already you know the german people were feeling very low at that point he channeled their outrage and started world war ii and you know there's a lot of outrage in there uh in, in this whole culture right now there's so many things and we don't know collectively when i say we go i mean as a society we don't have very good um forums and skills for having the conversation for um, righteous indignation and outrage because there's a lot to be righteously indignant about but it just shows up as people screaming at each other and that's not productive so how do you listen to somebody who is righteously indignant in a way that allows them the space to be that so that they can get that energy out and then come back down to a more reasonable way of dealing because that level of emotion is going to block people from having productive conversations so it's got to find an outlet and it needs a receptive audience. And, and I think this is something that, that really could be hugely impactful for um, the culture if we could start to have these conversations where people can express their outrage, be witness, be heard for it, and then say, okay, good, I got that out. Now let's do something. Let's let's talk it, about it in a different way where I'm a little bit, you know, I've, I've vented now. I can be more reasonable. Um, Ken, thank you. Our Gil NVC is nonviolent communication. Uh, I'm, um, after the 2016 election, I did some videos about Trump and I realized I sort of went through and enumerated the Trump playbook. And one of the things that the left and the media didn't understand was that Trump understood how visuals affect people. And he knew that if your enemies are yelling at you and if, if, if like, if, if the moderators are critiquing you and eviscerating you, but on screen, they're showing you looking commanding and really interesting. That's a win for the person walking by the, the TV in the airport or in the mall or wherever else, that the visuals really, really mattered. And I don't know how much that's going to play out now, but, but, but the media didn't understand and maybe does now. I don't really know, but sometimes they show signs that they are. Uh, oh, thanks, Gil. I didn't realize you you needed you weren't asking about the acronym. I'm looking at the chat here. Um, the media kept feeding this because they were being lo looped into. And I'm sitting here wondering if uh, uh, Lauren Boebert in the theater uh, is just a play for her to stay in the news. And and she's she's a definite Trumpian. She is one of Trump's biggest sort of uh, bootlickers. Uh, and is on the bandwagon big time. Uh, but maybe that whole thing is manufactured because she knows that if she's outrageous in public uh, on an off week, she can own the media cycle. And owning the media cycle is a win for your followers if you're MAGA. Like like a piece of the MAGA game is, hey, look, I can poke, I can poke the crowd and work them into a froth. I can kind of float above the, the the fray because ah, I was just a youthful indiscretion or gosh, sometimes I'm an outrageous personality and that's what why some of my followers like me. And then man, you just got a whole bunch of free uh, free airtime. And and so there's there's this angle of media dynamics that plays into the same the same thing. Uh, Stuart then Gill. Yeah, um, distinction between uh, differences and conflict, right? Uh, differences are all over the place. Uh, conflict happens when people become ego identified and think that they're right. <laughs> and, and then there's no, there's no listening and, 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 and there's no curiosity about, so what is it, um, that's, how did you get that way? Geez, I'm really curious about how that belief system developed and, and, and why you think, um, that way. Hmm. That's interesting. So conflict and difference is important. And in terms of the where where Ken was pointing to in terms of um, uh, place to express some outrage, um, I put my cycle of resolution model in the in the chat. Um, and I will often um, when I'm doing some mediation or counseling, I'll say, you know, in this first round, 
of conversation, you may hear things that you don't like. Um, it's not necessarily the truth. We're just doing it to get it up and out so that we can move on to more um, productive conversations. And so people need that place um, to empty, to set the table so that there can be engagement at some um, very, very different level. And um, with most people, um, the humanity, the compassionate, uh, the empathetic part eventually kicks in and they realize that the quote other um, uh, is perhaps not so different than they are and that they were trying to do the best that they possibly could. Um, the other piece is, you know, what we're talking about, I think it ties in with um, identity, the, the quote, the whole realm of identity politics. And we've become a nation where people, um, whatever their, their difference is, you know, that's the identity that they've um, assumed. Um, especially true with, quote, any kind of disability. Um, people are on the bandwagon for their, you know, their disability. And uh, yeah, I think we've devolved um, into that to, 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 to some, some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, popping the top on the can of identity politics worms, which is interesting as well. Um, thanks. Do, yeah, do check out the cycle of resolution because it's a it's a model for conversation, um, um, and it allows for all of that um, nasty expression to actually um, come out. It takes obviously a certain degree of emotional intelligence to be able to stand in that and to not just get into a a, a piece of. Um, you know, argutainment or would you, would you angertainment, uh, you know, one of those, one of, one of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angertainment. Uh, go ahead, Gil. Yeah. It takes physical practice too, Stuart. It takes, it takes, you know, conditioning the body uh, to be able to stand in that. We were talking about this on yesterday's living between worlds call about the, the Aikido experience. And Jerry, you know, this well, of uh, being able to maintain calm and center and breath in the face of attack and act e even real physical threat, uh, uh, not just emotional threat. Um, like the body has to learn different reflexes in that. Um, somebody said earlier, Jerry, I think you, you, you said something about the Buddhists and anger. And I don't know where we get this idea that Buddhists are opposed to anger. Um, maybe about maybe concerned about being trapped in anger, but I, I posted a Dalai Lama quote earlier up there, which said we're um, on a link. Um, Dalai Lama explains that all emotions have an evolutionary purpose and a biological dimension. In other words, they're natural responses to circumstances that appear in our lives. For example, he says, quote, anger helps us repel forces that are detrimental to our survival and well-being. So there's that. Um, I, Ken, I liked your riff. Um, I like that the word indignity showed up in there uh, because I think there's a difference between outrage and anger and rage. Uh, and it's worth thinking into that. I was reading um, um, some reviews last night of um, this new translation of the Iliad. Um, and the Iliad starts with, and it, gets, it was like a whole riff about how translators translate and dramatically change the meaning of things. Uh, but the argument here was that the first word of the Iliad is rage. And it's a book about rage and rage is not the same as anger. Um, this translator said rage is, has a divine aspect to it. It's like it's a it's a bigger and more contextual and background thing. Um, um, and related to dignity related to indignity, to the to the opposition to indignity. And in being indignant is actually maybe a more powerful stance than being angry because it connects people back to the dignity that they're feeling violated. Um, so um, some thoughts there. Um, I'm not going to get started on the identity thing because I think it's a huge mess and worthy of a conversation at another time. Speak, speaking of Buddhism, mm -hmm. uh, we have... We have people learn, you know, exploring the the the. I don't even know what the noun is for it, exploring the thing of there is no self, and then we're fighting fiercely over interpretations of self. It's very strange. That's it. Um, 
Thanks, Gil. Uh, Doug, then, Doug C., then Stuart, and uh, take your time stepping in. We're going pretty quickly, as is often typical of us. Well, I'm thinking about what are we really talking about here? And what strikes me is we're looking at rage and reason as choices for an individual uh, in a conversation. But we're not talking about is the quality of the whole civilization and its ability to have conversation uh, versus rage in a thought. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, it seems to me that uh, if you want a civilized world, you can't, it's impossible to rely on individuals to get there. Uh, the quality of the whole culture is what's important. Uh, I think one of the things about Athens in the time of Plato was how conversationally based it was and how that worked. Uh, we don't have that kind of uh, cultural fabric where a group can really participate in a reasoned conversation. And it's not individual versus the group, it's the quality of the group that needs development. I would say that little tiny fractal side conversations like this one are sort of disproving your thesis. Now, if you're talking about the public sphere, a part of my belief system is that the far right has figured out intentionally, I call this denial of discourse attacks, um, that there's an organized way to go about making sure that we don't have civil discourse, that everybody's like all up, you know, all up in anger and and doubting and skeptical of the other and all that. That is that is a, a tactic in 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 battle, in verbal battle, that is happening every day. We're seeing that all the time. But but there's plenty of people talking in civil ways. I think all of us are in several zooms a week where people are trying really hard to set, to settle in, and uh, and you know talk well about this and figure out how how we move forward. Um. Stuart and Gill. Yeah. Um, just quickly to me where this conversation is pointing to, um, and Jerry, you set it up just very well, um, is um, the education of, of folks to be able to engage in these kinds of conversations. And if everybody wasn't running around trying to either survive or make more money, there'd be a little bit of brain space to actually <laughs> be able to, to do that. And Gil, Gil pointed out earlier, you know, conditioning of the body also for how to engage in those conversations. And on a more humorous note, talking about rage, um, it's a great scene in one of Woody Allen's movies where uh, his rage had escaped and it was it was rummaging through the countryside. <laughs> and you see a back shot of, of, I don't know what character he was playing in the movie. I think it may have been Zelig, I, I, I don't know, but it's just running through the countryside. His rage has escaped and it's ramping through the countryside. <laughs> and everybody better be careful because the rage is on the loose. It's apparently Take the Money and Run, which is a yeah. total, an awful slapstick movie, but there you are. <laughs> It's yeah. Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Gil, then Pete, then Stacy. There's a strange <clears throat> and wonderful TEDx talk by David Graeber, who uh, we've talked about a lot, and it's called um, The Possibility of Political Pleasure. Uh, and he talks about his love for political meetings and cultures where, um, um, I forget where he, he, he talked, he, he did a lot of his work in Madagascar and he talked about a culture of, 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 of social interaction around you know, political questions, long, many, many hour meetings. You mentioned one, I don't know if it was Madagascar or somewhere else, we talked about 14 hour community meetings that people loved because they got to get heard and they got to work things out together. And it's very it was it was it was kind of startling to me because it's so different than my experience of political meetings um, um which is a whole other rant but uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat i'd be interested in what people have to say about it uh pete has beat you to that 
um, as happens now and then over here. Uh, and, and and he beat me by only about four seconds. So there we go. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, tough, it's tough to beat Pete in general, but especially when you're speaking. And yeah. have to post the same time. The, guy, the guy's got reflexes. Well, speaking of conditioning the body, here's Pete. That's right. The only way to beat that is to preload the links you think you might mention. So you've got to kind of like like cue <laughs> cue ahead of time, and then you're good. There's, and there's no beating that when you just hit return as you're speaking. But short of that, there's no hope. Um, Pete and Stacy. I I don't want to distract us from our productive discussion of rage and conflict and resolution, um, but I I also wanted to note that we seem to live in a time where people with a lot of power, um, either billionaires or media moguls or big corporations or something like that, um, will have a sociopathic belief uh, system. Uh, and through think tanks or lobbying or whatever, they inculcate um, our lawmakers and our politicians into um, uh, a, a double speak version of you know they'll they'll take a bad thing a really bad thing um, and they'll make it sound virtuous and then they'll give it to the the people they're donating to and say you know this is this this ought to be part of your platform because it's good and wonderful and holy I don't know why you wouldn't say this to the world right um, and by the way here's a lot of money um, so then. Uh, another part of our, our culture is to not be able to converse very deeply, not be able to think very deeply. And so it's, it bubbles up that that concept gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And then it gets hardened into, um, you know, a, a, a core part of our, our well-being um, or our, our perceived well-being. And so it becomes kind of a, you know, a, an almost unconscious thought, unconscious belief that everybody has that this thing that is actually bad and sociopathic. And if you talked about it for a while, you'd say, yeah, that's bad. Everyone thinks it's good. Um, so I'm, I'm watching a, a, I'm watching a, an important issue. Uh, it's kind of small, but intense. Um, uh, and Oddly enough, the right, which is wrong on so many things, um, has the has the actually good um, version of of this thing in their platform. And so I'm watching people on the left say, you know, the left has bought bought this issue hook, line, and sinker, and they're feeding it back to us, and they've they they give no quarter on this because they think they're right. Um, and it, it helps that, you know, billionaires have helped them to think that it's right, but it's wrong and it's wrong for me. And if I look to my political realms, I, I don't have a place, but these people, the right are speaking truth for that issue that matters to me a lot. I'm going to vote, <laughs> I'm going to vote Republican. I'm going to vote conservative because until the Democrats or the, the liberals, you know, get their you know get their head screwed on straight uh this issue is important enough to me that i i have to like draw the line and you know make make a change that i you know otherwise the, you know these people are my enemy but on this one they're you know they're friendly to truth and my my you know belief in something sacred and important in my life and so i swing over to the wrong side um at least for a time um, and hope for um, balance in the world that way. And so it's a strange and you know scary and terrifying kind of thing. And I, I think you know history teaches us. I think this is kind of the way fascism works. You know, it, it double double thinks and double speaks you into believing that that uh, you know something that's really bad is actually virtuous. And so along with being able to amp up things or um, rage farm, um, we also end up with a, a stealth uh, um, uh, undermining of, you know, uh, real um, uh, community value. 
Thanks. Stacey, then Ken, then me. It's, it struck me as I was passing a meme that talked about most people in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States not being able to read above a sixth grade level that the difference between a sixth grade level and an eighth grade level really has to do with critical thinking. I mean, that's what changes the scores in your reading. And I don't have any evidence to support this, but I imagine that critical thinking is somewhat correlated to emotional intelligence. Like I said, I have no proof. Um, maybe it's out there somewhere. But to go back to what Doug C was saying, I agree with that because, and I understand, Jerry, what you were saying, but I don't think groups like ours are really representative of the general population. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Stacey. We all like to think of ourselves as normal. There's a go big ahead, difference Ken. between normal and representative. <laughs> Good point. You were just put New England town halls in the chat, and I, I just have to say that um, New England town halls were an amazing thing, and they worked really well, but they worked well because the towns were small and people lived together closely and they had to help each other because, you know, you couldn't bring on your harvest by yourself. You needed your neighbors to help, and, you know, it was a very different time when town halls were effective. At this point now, you know, I go to city council meetings and there'll be 300 people there and you have two minutes to make your statement. And that's not a conversation. It's it's a horrible way. Yeah, sure. I got to say my piece, but so did 299 other people who were disagreeing with me or amplifying what I was saying. And it's just, it, it doesn't, it's, it's become ineffective. So um, I love the model of the town hall, but what's missing from the town hall is that that sense of community, that sense of we depend on each other. And I think that's one of the big challenges we face right now is people have this idea that, you know, we don't, we're not dependent upon each other. And as, um, as things heat up, literally and metaphorically, uh, I think we're going to discover just how much we will come to depend on each other. Uh, Doug's been writing about this for a long time with Garden World, that, you know, we're, we're in a state where uh, the entire system is very precariously balanced and likely to start to fall apart. And um, it's not going to be the survivalists and the the really wealthy people who, you know, are behind uh, fenced in gates and, and you know, have private security. It's going to be the folks who come together and say, you know, hey, let me help you out here. Or I've got something that, you know, I need this and you have that and let's work together, which has always been the way humans have gotten along is through cooperation and collaboration. Um, you know, it's it's not... Maturana talks about for for millennia, we lived in small groups where you had to cooperate in order to get to, in order to survive. And then somewhere along the line, so so that part we conserved love. We made the world safer, helpless, naked little babies who are tasty to predators and very vulnerable to grow up in to become adults. And somewhere along the line, we began to conserve a different kind of behavior, a hatred, a, a, a despise, a despising of other people, a, a better than. And that's a, a pathological conservation in our um of behavior in our in our cultures so you know getting back to i see you you have the right to exist you see me i have the right to exist we need to figure out how to get along together it keeps coming back to that for me again and again and again and there's all these reasons why we can't people always have you know well what about this and that and we've got to work this out i mean bohm and david bohm worked with christian murray to develop dialogue because he was going to conferences where people with entire alphabets after their names so many you know advanced degrees so much education they were almost coming to blows over whose idea was right and he's like this is no way to run a freaking science fair so you know we we gotta we gotta wake up here and recognize that um as the the africans say ubuntu you know i am because we are and that's a fundamental shift in in attitude and opinion i think that's growing but it's meeting a lot of resistance did, did they get that from the linux distribution name uh -huh. yeah i think they did actually <laughs> uh -huh. sorry i'm gonna go quiet for just a second so we can process everything everybody's been saying it's a, there's a lot on the table right now let me take us into silence i'll bring us back out in a sec
Carl just put Rosa Subisarreta, Subisarreta in the, the chat, who is awesome. So I recommend following whatever she was talking about or doing. Uh, I have mentioned, I think, a couple of times here that I, I've made a new friend who is much more conservative than me, but thinks that MAGA is completely dysfunctional and maybe going to kill us all. But he's really frustrated with progressives. And he has a lot of <clears throat> very direct critiques of the progressive movement and progressives in general. He has a lot of overgeneralizations, it seems to me, that that he calls them performative progressives or something like that, where he says so many, so many people who are on the progressive side are just saying good stuff and feeling good about it and doing nothing. <clears throat> and part of the problem in different ways. And that's just one of his many critiques. Um, but I think that. Um, I think that's a really interesting point of view, and I'm trying to, I, I haven't really met, described the, this call to him, but I'd like to invite him in so that we can have a broader mix in the conversation so that he can see what we're doing and we can maybe peel this apart a little bit together. It feels to me like maybe in two weeks, uh, we could talk a bit about the revival part of this conversation. We've been talking more about collapse by a lot, and uh, there's sort of, we're we're seeing uh, we're getting some nice links. Uh, Ken posted uh, <clears throat> uh, Guzman's book about I Never Thought About It That Way. There's a whole bunch of different approaches toward bridging these divides. And uh, uh, so I, I would be really interested in, in us sharing or even inviting in uh, people who have a lot of direct experience in uh, those aspects of healing uh, conversation, healing the discourse or dialogue, healing the, the, the divide, but also approaches toward healing the planet and, and fixing stuff. I think there's a, a lot there that we haven't, uh, haven't done that much about. Uh, Stuart, then Doug C, then Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, comment on, um, on what Pete was saying about right and wrong, um, and and just reflecting on that, you know, beneath right and wrong, um, being curious about the value system that particular behavior or action is reflective of, um, and being curious about how people develop the the mindset the the value the right or wrong that they had um as a, a piece of the curiosity dialogue um because inherently there is no right or wrong um i'm in, in some sense except for you know 10 commandment kinds of kinds of things um you know don't kill and you know don't mess around with somebody else's wife um or husband <laughs> um and um the other thought that I had was, <laughs> we need a big time out, you know. As I as I understand it um, from sailors, if you're in trouble, you let go of everything. Um, and there's a way in which, as a as a civilization, as a species, right now, we need to just take a moment of time out and silence and just let go of everything because we're all on this crazy treadmill that is just creating more and more and more and more churn and we just need to have a big you know time out and let go and let go for a while it's kind of like you know the stories about and i and i think that they've come up here when um the generals in world war one uh uh decided to have a an armistice for christmas and the combatants on either side started playing soccer with each other. <laughs> and they just realized that, you know, what they were engaged in was just a big, you know, silly kind of folly. Um, but we need a big time out, big time out. Doug C, then Pete. So I'm inclined to start at the opposite end away from the individual. The reality is we have a civilization that's not capable of dealing with its major problems. That's not a good position to be in. But we've got to think of in terms of the civilization, not individual attitudes.
Yeah, and I just have to say quickly, but the civilization is made up of individuals and it often starts at a micro level. The individuals are made up of civilizations. <laughs> chicken or egg, chicken or egg, chicken or egg. <laughs> Maybe we could start the chicken or egg political party. <laughs> So that I say, Kawabanga. <laughs> um, An example of something that has really bothered me in the last 24 hours is a statement that I think was in the New York Times from, El from uh, John Kerry, saying that it's important that we free up lots more investment capital in order to move the third world into energy independence as rapidly as possible. That is just totally nonsense. And the fact that uh, investment in more technology is going to cope with climate change is just fallacious. And that they hear somebody like Kerry, who's a pretty savvy guy, saying that, which is really just putting forth the agenda of the business community, really disturbed me. And I do think Pete is trying to gift us a moment of silence. Perhaps. Maybe. Um, it's also it's also fun to hear a conversation. Um, Stuart, I appreciate your your time out. Um, and Doug, I appreciate um, you saying that we have a civilization level problem. I it's I in, in some ways I uh, um, a human civilization is kind of it it seems to me to be a little bit uh, un, un, unsustainable. Um, it's easy to kind of rationalize that, well, I'm a reasonable person and I can have patience long enough to listen to somebody who I think is unreasonable, patience and curiosity enough to someone who, uh, listen to somebody who I think is unreasonable. And if we talk long enough, it's going to, you know, make sense. We can make civilization between me and her or me and him. And it's easy to think that. And I think it's super, 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 super hard to scale. Um, I think we just end up with the you know the it's, it's the hyperscale superstructures that I talk about where when you have a million people or a billion people in interacting you get really weird to us really weird to human scale um, emergent behaviors of you know social big social structures that we don't really understand very well so I think I I'm, it, it's it's I it's tempting to go well why don't we just fix this and I'm not sure that we have the right levers or that we have the even the capability, even if we all gang up on, you know, a large scale social structure. I'm not sure we get there. Um, what I wanted to say, though, um, Stuart, thank you for time out and thank you for saying many issues are not right or wrong. Uh, the issue I'm thinking about it is actually a Ten Commandments kind, kind of issue. Um, it's actually stronger than I think a lot of those commandments or deeper. Um, uh, it's about um, uh, agency and um, uh, abuse uh, and freedom from other people being able to abuse you um, uh, and harm you and assault you. Um, so it's it's, you know, it, it, it's a thing where you can say, um, I, I think there is a right and a, and a wrong. Um, uh, and further, interestingly enough, um, the people I hear talking about this um, get really upset. And, and I'm going to say this word righteously, righteously so. Um, I actually mean that literally, righteously so. I think they're in the right um, when they say, I don't want to be assaulted. There's, there's parts of my life where I need to have agency and I need to be free from assault. And you're legislating it so that I have to agree to assault. And, um, and if, if I even say something about it, you've legislated a need for me to be re-educated um, so that I, I, I have to say that assault is fine in, in this situation because we all agree that you know, this situation is wonderful, not, not bad. So, um, so the people involved in this, it, it's, 
it's personal enough that they take it personally and they get upset and they fight. And at a distance, I think what's happening is um, somebody like, it, it's like you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't fight on either side of this unless you were really provoked and really well-funded, um, well-resourced, maybe not necessarily money. But, um, but I, I think there are people who are saying, hey, this is a, you know, uh, uh, our market research or our AIs uh, say that if we distract enough people with a, a, enough issues uh, and having them feel like they're righteously fighting about an issue, they're not going to look at this other situation that we actually care about. I think there are people with a lot of resources picking fights between between groups of people and inserting, it, it reminds me of uh, what we used to call stochastic violence, I think, where you just you just feed the bad parts of, you know, you, you, you pick, um, uh, you pick assaultative individuals uh, and you just encourage 100,000 of them. And most of them are going to be held back uh, in, in their assaultative behavior um, by, you know, by their family members or by the police or by, you know, uh, uh, counselors or um, uh, parole officers or something. But out of 100,000, you're going to get 100 that break through all those strictures and do something really assaultative to society, right? So I think that's still happening. I think we've gotten a lot more sophisticated than the days of 9-11. Um, but I think there are people with a lot of resources and they said, um, I wanna do this crappy stuff over here and I'm just going to start a bunch of tears in, in the fabric of society um, and keep pouring you know, gasoline on those little fires that I've started. I don't actually care one way or the other how the fire burns. Mostly I care that the fabric of society burns. So I think that's what's going on. I, I can see that from a distance where I'm not being assaulted. I'm not in the position of being one of the people who's going to end up in this. But you know, it's, it's really strange because it's like normal humanity, even the assaultative individuals would get tamped down and somebody's pouring gasoline on it and, and keeping it going. As a tactic and a strategy, and I hate to say it, it's a very viable and time-honored tactic and strategy. And it's just underhanded, devious, and destructive. But there it is. And, and, a, a, and an irony in this one is that the good guys have gotten, you know, the, the, the left or whatever, the people who we think are the good guys for whatever reason, the, the people who are usually more or less in the right are on the complete wrong side of this and using every power that they've got to, to um, you know, enjoin forces of right uh, in something that's assaultative. And so it's, you know, like it's a, even a twist on a twist. It's really weird. Here to sort this all out and tell us what the solutions are is Ken. No pressure. Piece of cake. Uh, remember the main. Interesting. You know, the the more recent research has determined that it blew up due to a boiler problem. It was not sunk by the uh, uh, the enemy. Um, but like so many other things, it's been used to like you know, the Gulf of Tonkin around. Exactly. Same, same thing, same thing. Um, I dropped uh, an excerpt from an interview with Vaslav Smeal into the chat. And I just want to point out one thing, which I think has really struck me, where he says, um, you know, it's really important not to talk about uh, talk about the world in global terms. There's We've talked about this on this call before. We have a poly crisis, a meta crisis. There's going to be multiple solutions that are geographically uh, based, and they'll be different in different places. You know, and he he's, he gives this example of Thomas Friedman that everything is the world is flat, everything works. You know, everywhere, but you know, Denmark has nothing in common with Nigeria. Um, Nigeria needs more food; they need more growth. Philippines a little bit more. Canada and Sweden a lot less of it. So, it, I think we get ourselves into. Uh, a difficult situation when we start to feel apply the one size fits all model of you know this is how it has to be, um, because 
it is going to be very different in different places. And, um, you know, there are places where in order to provide basic services to people, food, shelter, and, and um, clothing and education, they'll need more development. And there's places where in the U.S., if we simply eliminated our food waste, we could feed everybody in this country no problem at all. It's amazing how much food goes to waste in this country and that there's hungry people when there's this much food waste to me is a, a conversation for um, righteous indignation. You know, that's that's a it just kills me that we've got so much food being wasted, especially prepared foods. Restaurants throw out 50 percent of their food. Oh, my God. You know, just I, I, I see people on the street in San Rafael who are hungry while there's restaurants throwing food out. I, what? Why can't we get this together enough to just have a little compassion? And my answer to that is the Puritan street that says those people don't work. They don't deserve anything. And, you know, I think it was Nietzsche said, beware of those in whom the urge to punish is strong. And there's a lot of folks who have that strong urge to punish who are in positions of power and, and privilege. And all they want to do is, you know, make other people suffer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for more compassionate um, ways of being. Michael, whenever you wish. Um, I, since I joined late, this may have been, uh, brought up, but I, you know, came in on the discussion of, uh, well, a bunch of things, but, but town halls and the, you know, the, the voice of the people manifesting itself in a series of people coming up to podiums and emphatically, you know, uh, stating their points of view. And last week I was part of a group um, at the Canadian consulate here um, for, there was, a, there was a little responsible tech summit. Um, and our, our Canadian friends were talking about uh, their citizen assembly approach to some of the issues around online harms. And it was, it was really inspiring. It was very much not the town hall model. It was a model of um, more like a jury pool um, or a number of jury pools um, bringing people together. And there was, there was a woman there who was like, you know, one of the the youth representatives to the citizen assembly who was um, 17 at the time that she per participated in the assembly, but she was there because a lot of the issues in dealing with online harms had to do with people who were younger than voting age. And so the, their voices needed to be in the room and the charge for the citizen assembly was to, as a group, um, come up with solutions, not to, espouse their point of view for somebody else to make the decision and the power of that difference um what is really apparent to me um i mean it, it it forces people with opposing points of view to to find common ground because they're charged with just like a jury you know reaching a verdict not that i suppose in certain polarized situations you couldn't have the equivalent of a mistrial, um, but you know, having groups come together to make um, proposals that then legislators can upvote or downvote um, seems like a really strong approach. And I, I'm I'm reading up on. I'll, I'll, looks like Jerry might have. Um, no, he's not. Uh, well. Um, I'll, I'll post some things, some links about uh, Citizen Assembly. Uh, I did post an, an article about Citizen Assembly. That's the Noe uh, magazine. Ah, okay. good, the, good, the third good. link I posted is about Citizen Assemblies. There's also okay. deliberative polling, uh, which James Fishkin kind of created and runs out of Stanford. That's a highly functional method. <clears throat> and there's a 
actually, since nobody's got their hand up in the queue, let me go there for a second. Deliberative polling, I've not experienced firsthand, but I've, I've met Fishkin and sort of listened to it some. And basically, uh, you commission position papers to be written about certain issues. You bring people in, I think it's for two weekends or something like that. Uh, the, the key is that some time goes by. Another key is that you pull people as they come in. What are your opinions on all these things? And then there's a particular process about how to talk through the issues at hand um, that leads more than most any other group process to a shift of opinions. So because they take a poll before and after, uh, Ken, you want to jump in? Uh, you're muted. Newbie mistake. Totally got it. I was a facilitator for a, a deliberative poll a few years ago. And um, this one was in San Mateo. Um, and it's like, okay, San Mateo is going to have a big housing shortage. So there were four options. Do nothing. Um, open up open space to development. Do higher infill um, uh, use. And um, the fourth one was... Um, put toll roads in because there's so many people that travel through San Mateo on their way to work. And the way it works is you had to fill out your a very detailed questionnaire that was coded. So it was anonymous. Um, and the only way you got, everybody got paid in cash for their participation. The only way you got your cash was by filling out the second poll at the end. And that's how they made sure that you actually get a, a shift. And what was amazing was, um, there's a there is a, a booklet you had to read about 60 pages detailing each of the four scenarios. And there were groups of 10 people with facilitators in each group who would make sure everybody had a chance to speak and they would develop questions and they would go to a plenary session. There'd be ex, a panel of experts talking about that one scenario, there were four panels. So each scenario had a, a panel and people would say, all right, well, so tell us what it looks like. You know, do you have samples of, of high density infill housing? Can we see that? What's that look like? And there was a huge shift at the end where people who had said, no, we should open open space recognized if you open up open space for development, the only thing that's going to go in there are million dollar homes that no one can afford except for millionaires. And so by a huge margin, the shift went from open space to high density infill housing because they saw it was very doable. It didn't have to be huge, huge towers. You could have four or five stories, you know, and retail space below and make neighborhoods walkable. And if you just got in and said, look at all these great things, but the process of over the course of the weekend, talking with each other and hearing everybody's pers perspectives was really remarkable. And I'll say one more thing, which is there's a woman there who was probably in her 50s and her parents had this house she'd grown up in. But she had three siblings and her parents were close to the end of their lives. She's like, when my parents go, the house will be split between the four of us. If we sell it, None of us will have enough money to live. We can't all live together because everybody has families. And I'm the one who's going to be, I'm a single person here. I'm going to lose my home. I'll have been here my entire life. I'm going to lose it. And there was a man in my group who owned several apartment buildings. And he said, I'm going to give you an apartment rent free. Says, I really like you. I don't want you to lose your home. And people were weeping. I mean, it was an amazing moment where this guy said, I see your pain and I have more than I need. Let me help you out. And so amazing things can come out of this that that aren't even um, supposed to be part of it. Um, Ken, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and I want to go back and marry the idea of deliberative polling to a story I've told in, in OGM calls, I think several times, but I'll tell it really quickly once again. Jimmy Wales, a week after Pro, uh, Pope Benedict was made Pope, uh, said that he'd got a lot, a lot of congratulatory emails from, from journalists and others, like how quickly Wikipedia had a page up. And he laughs and he says, we had a page on every bishop who was up. All somebody did on the, when the white smoke went up was change the first paragraph, rename the page and hit save. And there was a great thorough profile because Wikipedia is an ongoing adventure to understand the world and digest it and make it better all the time. The problem I had with deliberative polling was that they had to commission papers to do, do position papers. This was a once in a every every now long period event. This wasn't a town hall or an ongoing conversation or an ongoing meeting of any kind. It was a very special, you know, the deliberative poll was a very special event that wasn't likely to be repeated in this particular jurisdiction again anytime soon. I, I don't know of any um, communities that do deliberative polling regularly all the time because they've folded it into their process, but also 
this notion of being in conversation, debate, and experimentation in your communities over time is the thing I wish we did. And um, we don't do it. And, and Oscar Wilde famously said, I, you know, I, I go for socialism, but I'd like my, I like my evenings. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him poorly. Uh, because because being in community and being engaged takes someone's time, but the, it doesn't take everybody's time. And if some people are actually earnestly in that effort, and if that's transparent and visible to the rest of the population, then we can choose where we are on these different kinds of issues in, in more productive ways. But I think uh, we need to rethink how we make decisions and how we, how we do things together uh, from a, a much more thorough uh, basis than we have been doing so far. Uh, Stuart, whenever you're done swallowing, uh, you're next. And you're muted just in case you're not noticing. You did. Thanks. So um, just a, a few random thoughts. One, um, anthropologically, um, to my knowledge, um, people used to hang out in groups of, you know, somewhere between 14 and 20 people that that was the optimal for human beings to get along and work well with each other. Of course, we're, we are way beyond that, but it just points towards something important in terms of where we are in, in, in mass civilization. Um, two, um, just to follow up with Ken, um, I was, I was a, a volunteer facilitator for um, 5,000 people after 9-11, they invited many of the relatives of survivors to meet at the Javits Center. They had 500 tables of 10 to figure out, you know, what to do with um, Ground Zero. And there was polling, but they, there was also some textual response in terms of um, input from each of the tables. And somehow they had an algorithm that processed everything. And as people left they were given a uh, you know a multi-page report on on what the uh, outcome of the day was so you know that ties into the whole notion of jerry what you raised i think the the term of deliberative democracy and then um um the lenses um this goes back 25 30 years ago John and and John, I can't remember their exact name. I think the the, the guy died um, recently. Johnson and Peter Trudy Lenz. Peter, Peter and uh, Trudy Johnson Peter, Lenz. Right, and yeah. Peter and Peter just passed away. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were talking about you know deliberative democracy using technology for local communities 25, 30 years ago. 30. It's it's More. it's an it's a no yeah it's a no brainer. In some ways, it's a it's a it's a no brainer. Um, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Where does that put us? And how might we shape this a little bit into our conversations? Go ahead, Ken. Um, David Gertine, who some of you may know, um, talks about multipolar traps as um, things where um, self-interest outweighs collective interest. So people actually end up um, doing things that are harmful in the long run to themselves because they're they're saying, I, my self-interest trumps collective interest. And that's cancer, essentially, from a biological standpoint. You know, if, if you're taking stuff away from the, uh, the larger body of humanity or the planet or whatever larger body you're part of, um, eventually you're going to end up, you know, uh, terminating either yourself or the planet or both as we may be <laughs> heading for right now. So um, I think it's just really interesting to recognize there's, you know, essentially this call was supposed to be about um, collapse. Uh, and I, we, we've come at it from an obtuse angle, but I think we're still talking about the same thing of, of most of the really hard Technological technological problems we're facing have fixes. Climate change is a, it's a little more complex than that, but most things have um, we we have the technology to to solve it, but we lack the ability to come together and say 
we will do this collectively because there's too many individual um, interests saying, no, my interest has to be represented here and I, it can't exist with yours, co can't coexist with yours. So that takes it to a very different um, different plane of, all right, if that's the issue, what's the appropriate way in to start to unpack this and, and have it um, work in a different way? so that we might all be behaving in ways that serve our collective interests instead of go against them. Thanks, Ken. Uh, anyone else? Oh, go ahead, Doug, see. <clears throat> I think that if we say that we have the technology, then the only blame is on us for being so stupid. But if we don't have the technology, we have a very different problem. And I think it's just obvious we do not have the technology. We do not have technologies that can scale. We do not have technologies that will not produce more CO2. So we're deeply stuck. And I think only recognizing that do we have a chance of moving the civilization forward. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I see Julian is spending time in Oppenheimer's living room. I was just going to um, ask whether, you know, the term multipolar traps um, was, was mentioned. And it must feel like the bipolar traps trap well traps that we live with in the u.s may be worse than multipolar traps but not sure just want to say that thanks michael and i i would love to know more about them as well i remember the first good book of history i read was called tragedy and hope by carol quigley in which he describes in part, he, he describes how finance, the world of finance was shaped from 1900 through 1966 when the book is published. And a piece of it is his description of the Great Depression. And I think the Great Depression was a multipolar trap oh. because what he winds up describing is how each country's policies basically wedged it against the other, uh, the other countries and how nobody could extract themselves from this thing because everybody had sort of beliefs and dependencies and debts and whatever uh that that had them all locked in place uh with lots of players at the table with lots of money at stake the whole global economy at stake uh judy the floor is yours well i'm just reflecting and listening in terms of thinking about gaining attention and then action and engagement um we're living in an increasingly isolated culture where people don't engage, don't take the time to engage in actual thoughtful conversation or sharing of ideas. I think that's part of the reason we come to this meeting. But if, if we're trying to influence large groups of people, it still ends up starting with one or two who then influence two more and then you have four and then it, it can build. So I'm wondering if, there's room for a conversation about small initiatives that can become models to expand and be more broadly applied because we can only influence a limited number of people personally and books only reach a certain number of people based on reading level and behaviors and that's the same problem we have with the news media so in a sense it feels to me like there's a piece of personal connection and personal responsibility <laughs> it's one of the underlying things that we could try to focus on thanks judy and i th think that's a piece of what i was pointing toward when i was like how do we let's focus on the resilience revival revitalization side of it of what's being done what's working really well uh, what gets picked up um uh carl then doug c uh, Carl, then Julian, then Doug C. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, to wait for a ambulance to go by. Um, yeah, actually, I just posted a link. There was a 
Tragedy and Hope, uh, there was an interview with David Allen and the guy who interviews him actually does use the brain to um, talk Sweet. about. Yeah, the, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the resilience thing because I'd like to see if we could actually folk, I mean, every, almost every group I'm part of is just like in, seems to be in doomsday mode. So it would be nice to try to focus on the resilience piece of it. Um, I posted a number of, of um, links and stuff. Um, one of the um, workshops with my school, we actually had Donna, um, with um, George Mason, we actually had Donna Hicks talk and stuff. And I, she talks about dignity and, and uh, conflict resolution and stuff too. So there's, um, and then I also posted Mary Alice Arthur. She's um, been part of the storytelling community here in DC. In fact, she's referring to that in the video I posted, but um, it really comes down to facility. I've mentioned it before, but facilitation and stuff. I mean, that we can, that we've developed a way of being in these meetings. At least we get to escape for an hour, hour and a half at a time. And then, I, but it's really experiential. I mean, people have to experience that there's a different way of being than they are, than their dominant um, thing. And then you can, like um, Ray Anderson talks about, you can't really hold people accountable unless you can um, show an alternative and things. So I'll just stop with that. But look for a resilience conversation here in the future. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Julian, then Doug C. Uh, so one thing I was wondering about it, I haven't heard it come up, was the idea of the bad actor. And that the problem with discussing a lot of solutions is that there are people who have vested interest in making sure there aren't any solutions. And we've heard the term clickbait, for example. I brought up Remember the Main, not as an example of uh, who did it, but the fact that the way it was used. And uh, this morning, I think Rupert Murdoch has stepped down, but I don't expect that the Fox network is going to change its ways. And so you can come up with all the solutions you want, but if you have lots of big interests, um, investors who have their, oh, somebody, I think it was Ken who mentioned earlier about the needs of myself outweigh the needs of the many, you know, and, and brought opposition to Star Trek too. But the, the problem that I haven't heard brought up and really discussed is what do you do when there are a group of people who are absolutely dedicated to making sure you can't fix anything? And I don't have a solution. I'm just an irascible old man, but uh, I think that can't be left out. Just quickly, that's what Schmachtenberger says. We're always going to have actors outside of any system that you you develop to fix things that are going to just act on their own self-interest. Uh, can you spell, spell Schmachtenberger or put it in the chat? <laughs> yeah. Somebody will put the uh, Schmuckenberger has a lot of a, a lot of long interviews online. Um, I had I used to use a slide, I don't know how often, but pretty often, uh, which was a guaranteed last getter, where I'd say like, how do we deal with bad actors, as part of a serious discussion about you know social media online or just how do we run civilization? But that I would click and I would put up a big picture of David Hasselhoff. Um, and everybody would like get a little bit, a little bit of levity uh, in the conversation. Then I would go on after that. Um, some people do think Hasselhoff is a good actor, but I'm not among them. I knew I could count on you, Pete. <laughs> Looks like Pete moved. Really. <laughs> um, I will. Uh, Doug C, go ahead. Okay, I think we keep talking about the individual and their inability or ability to affect the group. It leaves out that the major actors of our time are big forces like climate change, debt, AI. Those are the things that as they evolve and emerge, affect the attitudes and the willingness of the whole environment the whole society to move.
And some of those things are human constructs. Others of those things are not. Yeah, but they're not individuals trying to persuade the group. Right. I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of, in some sense, collective hallucinations or willing suspension of disbelief by very large communities. I mean, money is that. It's an act of faith. Yeah, but uh, it's an act of faith. Whoop. Yeah. I believe that's Akebono, the really big guy. Just my take on all this focus on what the individual can do. Uh, as long as there's corporations with all these resources that are dedicated to drilling and, and burning oil, you can wash all the plastic bags you want and get a, ride your bike and walk and stuff, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to what these folks have. As a cynical, <clears throat> cynical side comment to that, I wanted to point out that when corporations engage in this crap, it's all tax deductible. But when or an individual engages in this crap, it's politicizing and not deductible. So that's a one method of making it, uh, trying to guarantee an outcome. So mm -hmm. We are nearing the end of our time together. Ken, I'm wondering if you've browsed a poem for us. But of course. But of course. <laughs> I, I just I, I I I know it's not the Jetsons, but it looks like you're living in the Jetsons house now. <laughs> <laughs> just wait for the going by, you know. I like, keep expecting your flying car to pull up to a dock yeah. outside. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a local it's minimum so... in in uh, generated backgrounds. I I actually prefer. Uh, I had a nice dark wood panel, you know, books and you know plants and stuff like that. But it's dark, <laughs> so this one is bright. <laughs> No, it looks great. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say before before Ken reads his poem yesterday on on um on the call that, that Gil and Ken run, it was about trying to uh, sense making, okay? Sense making. And what popped up for me so clearly was that you can't make sense of what's going on. <laughs> and, and perhaps that's a little bit of solace for the way our minds have all been trained and conditioned. You just can't make sense of what's going on. You can't make this stuff going on. It's it's just about suspending all kinds of your own levels of certainty. That's all. I just needed to say that. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. And, and I will just report that I am not as... Oh, hopeless as you just sounded about making sense of all this stuff. <laughs> no, I'm I'm fine with it. It's kind of like an Alfred E. Newman, what me worry a little bit. You know, I I it's not depressing. It's just the way it is. <laughs> and there we are. <laughs> okay. This is called the sleep of prisoners. The human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be. But this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries breaks, cracks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to face us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul humans ever took. Our fares are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration unto God. What are you making for? It takes many thousands of years to wake. But will you wake for pity's sake? Christopher Fry. And I'll post that to the list so people thank can you very much. reread it. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's, I, I was Googling as you did that part of a play. I don't know. I just have it as a poem in you know my in my library. Um, it seems like Christopher Pryor wrote a play that's a poem or something like that. I don't know. I didn't have a chance to figure it out. But thank um, you. I actually had another poem I was going to read just because it's a fun poem, and I <laughs> but I thought that one would fit. But I'll I'll read you a fun poem. I, I love this poem. This is another uh, Rilke poem. It's called Spanish the Spanish Dancer. As on all its sides, a kitchen match darts white flickering tongues before it bursts into flame. With the audience around her, quickened, hot, her dance begins to flicker in the dark room. And all at once it is completely fire. One upward glance and she ignites her hair and whirling faster and faster, fans her dress into passionate flames. 
till it becomes a furnace from which, like startled rattlesnakes, the long naked arms uncoil, aroused and clicking. And then, as if the fire were too tight around her body, she takes and flings it out haughtily with an imperious gesture and watches. It lies raging on the floor, still blazing up, and the flames refuse to die till, moving with total confidence and a sweet, exultant smile, she looks up finally and stamps it out with powerful, small feet. I love that poem. Spanish Dancer by Rilke. Thank you. Thank you. That is a lovely way to wrap our call today. I appreciate your all being here consistently over time and thoughtfully with your presence and soul and spirit. Um, all comments, conversations, welcome on the list and uh, see you all in a week. Uh, have a great week.